Ruth is the former head of the 19th Ward Community Association, was the first African American woman to serve on Rochester City Council, and became council president in 1986. A teacher by profession, Ruth has held many positions in the Rochester School District. She set up the reading lab at the former Wilson Junior High, was dean of women at the old Madison High School, and has served the district in advisory and troubleshooting roles. Given her background and her history, Ruth is able to offer unique insights on education and politics in Rochester. She and her husband, Bill, moved to the city in 1969. It was a transformative and vital time in Rochester politics. She also writes about her awareness of racial discrimination in her memoir, The Circles God Draws, which is for sale in the back today. And she defines as being about searching for and finding purpose in life despite the boxes people may try to force you to enter. So the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library is pleased to present today Ruth Holland Scott. Thank you very much. I was asked if I was a wanderer, <laughs> uh, whether I would just want to use this mic or whether Unfortunately, I am a wanderer. You can never tell where I may end up. I think probably uh, when I do questions, I do want to come down to the floor because I like to touch my audience a little bit when I'm asking questions. Good afternoon. Good to see you today. Um, I was uh, really had a difficult time trying to figure out how I might indeed um, begin this conversation which I'd like for us to have today because I would like to have it be a conversation and not just a lecture. Um, I think there are a couple of things that have happened of course in the public discourse and particularly in politics. You're not hearing me? Oh I didn't. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear it? That, okay. All right. <laughs> there are a couple of things that have happened in our country, and actually, indeed, around the world, where there's a lot going on in terms of rebellions, of people feeling somehow that their freedoms are compromised, and of other people feeling like, if you have freedom, I don't have freedom. And I guess one of the things, conclusions that I've kind of come to is that freedom liberty and civil rights require constant vigilance and unfortunately work. I think some of the things that are going on may indeed be like lancing a boil and you know sometimes when you lance a boil there's all that stuff that comes out and and it's poisonous and sometimes that venom and venom gets into other places that we would hope it did not. There are some small groups of people I think who who do not have extensive experience to know and understand what they're talking about, but it doesn't stop them from talking. And that's the interesting thing to me about the current day. Um, unfortunately, it, it is illustrated by the blatant disrespect for the president. I've never seen such a terrible time in terms of national politics where the leader of the country is vilified every day on the floor of Congress as an excuse for not doing anything that helps people in the country. Uh, there is still the situation, unfortunately, that we call DWB. Does anybody know what that means? Means driving while black. And it applies primarily to black men. Uh, when, you, when they're driving around a community or on the highway, very often they are stopped by the police, not for any apparent reason, but they are stopped and questioned and many times disrespected. Uh, one of the uh, kind of interesting situations that I dealt with here in Rochester, I've done a lot of mediations and a lot of training. And um, at one time, the University of Rochester uh, was having this problem with their students and the security people. And so the uh, president made a bold announcement 
that what he was going to do was to hire me <laughs> to, come, to come and train the security department. And I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think we've talked about this. What do you mean I'm going to come and train the security department? But anyway, we, we had a conversation. And what I said to him, I'm willing to do some work around that. But I need to have a better understanding of what has happened, both from the standpoint of the security department and from the standpoint of the students. And after I got that understanding, what I said was, I not only need to have this conversation with the security department, but you have got to find a way to mediate the problem between the people who were involved. And so I then called one of my colleagues and invited him in, it was Andrew Thomas in case some of you may know him, to come in and actually mediate between the two, three, four, five individuals who were involved. What I found out in that process, which really astounded me, and this has been a number of years ago, so hopefully and surely it's had to have changed by now. But what I found out in that situation was that the university had an agreement uh, with the Rochester Police Department that when students were, quote, acting up, the department would be called and it was their job to drive the students off campus to a parking lot and sort of put the fear of God in them, you know, like sort of harass them a little bit so that they would come back to campus and behave. Now the problem was these kids weren't doing anything. They were walking across campus after a social event. They were probably a little loud, most people are, <laughs> uh, on a Friday or Saturday night after an, a social event. And the guards said, who are you? And what part of Rochester do you come from? These kids, some of them were from New York City, some were from Louisiana, some were, other, from, were from other places across the country. So they had a right to be there. And it's this challenge to the right to be there that is one of the most egregious things about um, prejudice and exclusion and racism that continues to persist in our society. Um, there is still, unfortunately, an arresting of young people who are under 18, uh, or if not arresting them, at least putting them in a squad car when they are found standing on a corner. And again, this is part of the DWA, DWB, but it's just SWB, standing while black. Um, some of the young people that I know have come, been uh, sort of accosted by the police and told, what are you doing here? Do you go to school in this neighborhood? Do you live around here? Um, get in the car and we'll talk to you. Now, that is illegal because you should not do that with kids under a certain age without notifying their parents. Parents are never notified and the kids are simply sitting there getting more and more afraid. And now those young people from um, the University of Rochester, they had heard stories about kids disappearing, in the South at least, who were picked up by the police and taken to someplace dark and beaten up. And so naturally they got more and more boisterous and they were taken downtown and then the dean was called and finally the dean said, oh, I think this has gone on long enough, you can let them go. Egregious, egregious. Um, I also have been, been concerned about what has now become the temporary job market, which reinforces um, permanent unemployment. And that's the way I view it. And I'll tell you why I view it that way. Uh, a few years back, um, I was doing some research for an organization, uh, and it happened to be around employment. And they had not asked me to talk to the um, temporary employment bureaus, but we were beginning to get more and more people having to go through that process in order to get a job. And so I said to myself, that it doesn't really fit in what they asked me to do, but I really need to understand that piece of it because I think it's going to get larger. And lo and behold, it's gotten to be very large. And what I was told was on the QT, and that is if you repeat this, we will deny it, but on the QT, we are told by employers in this community, don't send us any blacks. Don't send us any Hispanics. We only want white people, not brown people. And so what does a lowly clerk in an office that hires do? They do what their employers tell them, or they don't have a job, okay? 
There's also this issue of the exclusion of low-income housing in the suburbs. Um, there is a presumption of incompetence, a presum presumption that poor means irresponsible, that poor means you're not going to be a good neighbor. And I have to tell you, I found none of those things to be true. Um, now, I, I want to go now, shift now to the book just a little bit and tell you some of the experiences that I talk about. Um, the book is a selection of stories of my journey from who I was to whom I was supposed to be. And at least one person of color, one person of the United States, one person in the world who was born without a voice box that was well developed enough in order for me to be heard when I cried. And so my parents were a little concerned and they carried me around on a pillow, at least that's what they tell me, uh, for a number of years until they could hear me. Um, my father was so afraid that I would never learn to talk maybe and he said when I started he thought I'd never shut up. But <laughs> I went from that point of life to a point of having full voice and using it every chance I got. <laughs> um, it is a story about uh, the circles that my family and the cousins and people provided for me. Many of the people who went to Albion, Mission, Michigan came as a result from companies going down south, passing out, this was foundries incidentally, passing out one-way bus tickets to Albion and, uh, so that they could work in the foundries. And many of, much of the migration that came from the South to Mich in Michigan was related to that business of supplying the car companies with parts. Um, my experiences are fairly broad. Um, and all of us have incidents in our lives that challenge us and that give us some experiences that sort of help to frame what we believe and how we see things. Um, my father, several years before I got to fifth grade, had started uh, on a crusade to close the one segregated school in Albion because it was a very bad school. And what um, people would say, it was so bad that, for instance, when I was in first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth grade, the teachers would say to us who were African American, if you don't behave, if you don't stop talking, I'm going to send you to Westport. Uh, and when I got there in sixth grade, what I found is books with no covers. A couple of teachers were very qualified and very wonderful teachers. A couple of them were really terrible, uh, were not certified, and they didn't do much teaching. And one of the women, she might have had um, the condition called narcolepsy, but she used to fall asleep. And so she would fall asleep in the middle of a class and the boys would take this stick from, you know, that you used to use, raise and lower the windows with. Some of you will remember those. And they would lift her wig off of her head. And she would wake up and say, recess, time for recess. And so those kids had recess perpetually all day long. But a friend of mine named Vern Kinsey and I decided when we go to high school, we're going to be in the college-bound group. And we can't afford to, to have recess. So we gave each other... Um, assignments and those assignments had to be finished before either one of us would allow the other one to go for research. Lots of people do those kind of things. They make do with what they have and they get around it any way they can. Um, so that's that's kind of what Vern and I did and then um, I have a, a chapter in the book called The Rumors of the Death of Jim Crow is Highly Exaggerated. You might be interested in that chapter. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you were here in 1964? Ooh, quite a few. Quite a few. Okay, how many of you were not here in 1964? Okay, well, really, it's about half and half. Okay, how many of you come from the West Coast? Anybody? Nobody. East Coast? Okay, South middle of the country <laughs> okay so we have lots of people here from different places and part of where you're from 
will consist of the framework that you may have in any event that you view. And I think that's very important to know. My, my framework, my family framework, and also turned out to be that of my husband's who actually grew up in White Plains, New York, and I grew up in Albion, Michigan. And that whole thing really was interesting because both of our parents taught us from the same playbook. Uh, that is, you are to live with dignity and respect. You're not to lie or steal, and if you did, there were certain consequences. Uh, you got a spanking for one thing, and depending on what it was, you got a, you were, your mouth was washed out with soap if you lied, uh, and you weren't to use foul language. And so there, it wasn't so much what the rules were, but the fact of the matter is that there were rules. And so that was important. And that a lot of people in their families as you were growing up had rules. They may not have all been the same, but they were rules. Um, we went to, uh, well, first let me say, my husband wrote the chapter about how we met, so I think you'll be interested in that. Um, then uh, we moved from a small town of Delavan, New York. Uh, Bill was teaching there. And talk about difficulty finding a job. He had sent out dozens of uh, resumes and applications, just as I did in Michigan. I was unable to get interviews in Michigan, even in my hometown, except one that I got in Eaton Rapids. And what they said was, um, if you come and become a librarian, about which I knew nothing, except that I love library and I love books, um, then, and that works out, meaning nobody would complain, then we'll consider hiring you in elementary school. Well, my, my focus was in secondary, you know. So I took myself off that summer and worked at a camp. Yeah, and that camp was in Ohio. And I decided that I would try to figure out how I was going to deal with the fact that they said they couldn't graduate me uh, because they didn't think they could place me and, uh, in secondary school. So I had to take elementary methods which blew my whole plan of operation. I had taken all these courses, doubled up, thought I would be able to spend the last year of my college years studying philosophy and music and art, <laughs> and that was all gone. And, but you know what? I learned how to teach in those elementary classes. They didn't teach me anything about teaching in secondary classes. They just taught me about the subject matter. I was going to teach English, and I loved English, but I didn't know a thing about teaching. And so actually it turned what was a disadvantage turned out to be an advantage for me. Um, then we, Bill and I, when we got married, uh, Bill went to Delavan, New York. He got a job there. It's a small town of about 5,000 people. Uh, it's, uh, if you take, draw a line uh, straight south from Buffalo uh, to the Pennsylvania border, you will go through Delavan about midway. Uh, Delavan had one stoplight. And as a matter of fact, he says when he went for his interview, he went through the light and had to turn around and come back. And there were all kinds of, um, there were petitions. He found this out later. There were sermons. There were all kinds of things because we turned out to be the only African-American family and the first one in that community. So when we got married, of course, I went where he was. <laughs> and uh, actually, we had a pretty good life there. We had good friends, uh, and we enjoyed being with the people there. And we didn't have any idea that we were going to move anyplace else because we were happy with each other, primarily. And so that was not so bad. But then a couple of things happened that made life less comfortable there. Uh, one was that the school districts merged, uh, Arcade New York merged with Delavan Machias School District. And those, that merger made it necessary to have a department and a department head in all the subject matter. And in music, um, Bill had been there uh, about nine years, and uh, he had been active in the uh, county music association. He, he became the president of the association. He took the kids to all county. They got good grades. Lots of acclaim for this little city of, of Delavan, New York. And he also was a constant and perpetual uh, chaperone for the kids who went on their trips to Washington, the seniors. And when I came, I joined him. In addition to that, he became a volunteer fireman. He also uh, was uh, a Kiwanian, became president of Kiwanis. 
that's another whole story I have to tell you sometime. But anyway, so he was very active, very committed to the community, uh, did a good job. Um, and they decided to appoint a man as chair of the department uh, who, uh, one year, I think, one year out of college? Two years out of college. Okay, he was two years out of college. Um, Adele Van was his second job. Uh, he, he did a lot of traveling on weekends to bands, for bands. He played in some groups. And he wasn't all that interested in kids. But he was made chair of the department. So that made us think, hmm, maybe we don't want to stay here. But there was an even more difficult problem. Uh, two th three things happened. There was the assassination of, uh, of uh, Martin Luther King, the assassination of John Kennedy. The conversation in that community made us wonder if it was too narrow for us to be there. Um, there was an antique car that was burned down uh, in a barn one night. I can't remember which assassination it was, but that was so much more important than whatever happened to these two guys. After all, John Kennedy was a Democrat and a Catholic, and that's another story, too, the Catholic part. And um, Martin Luther King, as far as they knew, was a troublemaker. So there was, and we said, hmm. And then one day our son came home and said, Mommy, what's a nigger? Am I a nigger? Well, we thought, you know what? Do we want to raise our kids here, or do we need to go to broader pastures? And that's how we got to, to Rochester. Now, because Rochester had had the riots, and there was lots of things going on around promises that had been made to fight and to other places, it was one of those promises was that there would be more African-American teachers. So naturally, when they saw Bill, and he didn't have an afro, and, <laughs> and he didn't have a tail, um, they, they, he didn't have a lot of trouble, and he'd been in one place for 10 years, they didn't have trouble getting a job here. And so, and, but his colleagues who were in the, Nash, in the um, uh, National Music Educators Association said to him, you don't want to be in Rochester. You know, come on, I got a job for you out here. I got a job out, and I don't know where, I don't remember now, but we'll just say uh, Penfield, Fairfort, you know, uh, Brockport, other places that when they were at the conference would put Rochester on their tag, but <laughs> didn't know much about Rochester and weren't in Rochester. But they said, you're going to be very unhappy there. But two things. First, Bill and I are always determined we're going to be happy. <laughs> and secondly, uh, we love the city. We really liked being in the city. And one of the things that precluded our coming was a letter from a lady whose name was Norma Brand. Norma somehow, and she was white, she found out that we were coming to Rochester. We never found out how she knew. But she sent us letters all summer with the real estate listings. And so when we came here, we was, she said to us, you've got to come to my house and use it as your headquarters when you look for housing. And so when we came, um, we went to her house. The door was closed. There was nobody there. But not ever having met us, she left the key in the mailbox, food in the refrigerator, and a note which said, go upstairs in such and such a bedroom, make yourself comfortable, and I'll talk to you when I get back. Turned out that she had found out that day that she had cancer, and she needed to get away, so she took a bike tour. And uh, later on, she introduced us to all kinds of people in Rochester. So that was, you know, they had said in Delvin, why are you going to Rochester? You belong here. You're not going to be happy in Rochester. You won't know anybody. Well, <laughs> that didn't turn out to be quite true. And yet there were many wonderful people in Delvin. And as a matter of fact, one of the other things that sort of um, propelled us into getting things done in, in um, Rochester was the fact that one of the women in Delvin... Um, was the home ec teacher for the Cornell Extension. And she took <clears throat> every new young married person under her wing to, to teach them how to keep house and blah, 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 blah. But one of the things she, she encouraged me to do was to continue my knitting. Uh, by the way, I knitted a half a dozen things for my husband before we got married, or before he popped the question, actually. So I, I don't know if that had anything to do with his deciding to marry me or not. But uh, she, she liked the things I had knitted, and she encouraged me to continue knitting. She taught me how to can. Uh, I had a little bit of experience with that with my mother and in my own home. 
but she made me enter my things in the New York State Fair, for which I won ribbons. <laughs> so that was kind of exciting. Um, and the other thing she did for me was uh, to, to tell Governor Rockefeller that she thought he ought to have a more diverse team of representatives for rural areas, because they had, he had these committees of women who were to represent rural areas and to connect state government with those areas. And uh, she therefore put my name forward and I went to these meetings with her. So when I got ready to move to Rochester, I said to him, I'm sorry, but I have to resign. And he said, where are you going? And I said, Rochester, New York. He said, oh no, I'm gonna have, a, I'm gonna have a representatives in the cities and I want you to be my first one. I don't think he ever got around to pointing any others. But he said, I have a job for you. I hear that there are problems in the jails in Rochester and I want you to investigate for me. And I had a little um, a statement in the phone book that said, Ruth Scott, state governor's representative. So people called me about all kinds of things, a lot of which didn't have anything to do with Governor Rockefeller, but, but I, my name was out there already and I couldn't pull it back, <laughs> unfortunately. That, so that happened. Those things prepared us uh, to be able to give some, some um, commitment to community here. Our parents had taught us to be interested in community. Um, it, Bill's parents uh, took care of one time, you know, when the state started letting people out of homes who had been taken care of all of their lives till they got to be adults and, and they were taken in as children and then when they got to be adults, the state no longer wanted to take care of them. And so they started placing them in homes around the state. And his mother was one of those people who actually took those young people in. My mother used to cook um, for everybody. I mean, she, she would put on two or three pots and we'd say, Mom, what, you know, what's this other pot of soup for? And she said, well, somebody might need it. And uh, she would invite people in to eat. And one day when we came home, she had several children uh, who were going to share our bedrooms. And we're saying, really, Mom? <laughs> And she, but she said, well, yes. And we said, well, why? And she said, because I've decided that they and their parents need a vacation from each other. And what had happened, there was a lot of abuse going on in that home. And she felt if the kids could have a respite from the parents, the parents could have a respite from the kids, that maybe things would be better. And she wanted to do her part in that. And so that's what she did. And so that also gave us a kind of sense of what we wanted to do in our own community. Um, what did I find, what would, did we find when we got here? Well, varying experiences like you and I just talked about, different frameworks of people. Uh, some people were in shell shock. Uh, how could this happen in Rochester? It's such a good community. Everybody has work, everybody, you know, uh, nobody's poor, everybody. Well, it wasn't everybody. It was the people in the circle that these individuals were talking about in their own circles who were well-educated, whose schools were good, whose neighborhoods were good, and who didn't have any problems. The rest of the community, a lot of it brown and black, were people who had come here from the South. Many of them came um, and did farm work, and they did not have, and they, they had followed the crops for many years and decided to settle in Rochester, because there were a few blacks here who were professionals. Some of them were teachers. Some of them had other professions, but not a lot. And so that, as that flood of people came, there was no attempt to, to incorporate them in the life of the community. There was no skill building. There was no educational opportunity. Uh, I am led to believe that the first African-American school was put together by some of the African-American teachers who were already here. And so they set up a school for the new arrivals. Um, but it wasn't enough, and, and the public schools were not all that interested. And as these children started to go to public schools, matters got worse in terms of anything that they may get. There was distrust when we got here. There was also a weariness. Um, a lot of African Americans said to us, uh, we're sick of talking about this. We're not going to talk anymore. You know, we had this demonstration um, five years ago. Um, we don't think conditions have improved. A lot of the uh, agreements that have been made were broken. Um, people, few people in Rochester got jobs in some of the factories around, but those were mostly menial jobs 
Even one man that we read into uh, who had a science degree, Chuck Frazier, was hired as a janitor at Kodak. Um, and when they looked for professionals, they do like so many communities do when you say you need to do more integrative things. They went south to the schools in the south and hired uh, young people who were looking for jobs and hungry for them to come to Rochester to teach. You had African-American young people who were in this town who had gone to colleges, many of them in the north, but they were not hired. Unfortunately, there is still a problem with that. We know young people who went to college and when they apply to the city school district, for whatever reason, they are not hired. I don't get it. But, that, but that's the condition that was and the condition that still is. Um, there, was, there were some people who were searching for solutions. And if you read the history of Rochester during that time, you'll find a lot of alphabet soup. <laughs> and, and I don't remember all of them, but I know one was CQIE, which was Citizens for Integrated Quality Education. Um, and that group tried very hard to try to figure out ways to keep the schools improving and receiving all children and teaching them well. Um, in the 19th Ward Community Association, we had a youth committee. Uh, when I, um, after a couple of years, I, chair, I chaired that committee. And we got one of the first, maybe the only grant that was ever given by the National Institute of Mental Health to set up a youth house, which was across the street from Wilson, the then Wilson High School. And uh, that committee uh, got that grant, and we decided we didn't want an ongoing grant. We just wanted to prove to the institutional groups in this community um, what could be done with young people. And so that's what we did. And then three years later, they asked us if we wanted another grant. And we said, oh, no, we've done our job. We can, tell, we can tell you what you need to do. I don't know if that was the wise decision or not, but, but it was a decision that we made. It was probably a good one in terms of process and of saying we can prove to you that these kids are not all bad. And you don't need to institutionalize them. All you need to do is teach them and love them and give them some direction. And um, that worked very well. And eventually I became the president of the 19th Ward Community Association, the first woman, um, the first African-American. The association at that time was tied up with a group called National Neighbors. These were people who met at Antioch uh, right after the riots across the country in the 60s and said, it looks like the things we fought for are going to all go down the drain. And we're not going to be able to build the kind of integrated communities that we'd like to build because we feel that government and other forces are going to overcome our efforts in terms of the cities that where we're trying to have integrated neighborhoods. And so they were trying to strategize around what to do about that. And when I became president of the association, I automatically became a member of that board. And then eventually I became president of the board. I, you know, I think I'm targeted, but anyway, I became president of the board. And I wound up traveling, traveling across the country to listen to and strategize with other neighborhood groups who were having similar problems. You know, um, uh, some governmental entity would decide in the integrated communities to build a highway through them, separating people. So the, the stuff they built in terms of community sense and working together got destroyed in that process. Or there wouldn't be any attention paid to the, ro to the roads in that part of the community and the sidewalks. And, as I told one of my colleagues when I became a member of city council, you don't have a right to decide which sidewalks you're going to fix and which roads you're going to fix. That's a public trust. And we have a responsibility to meet the needs of the community for all of the public trust that we hold. And sometimes that <laughs> went over well and sometimes it did not. Um, there were still problems with housing. Um, jails and criminal history uh, during that time, the criminal courts. I joined uh, Court Watch, which was a Church Women United group, who went into the courts and sat and listened to the differences between how African American, particularly children, were treated as related to how other children were treated when they came into the court system, and also the disparities between sentencing when you know, it was proven that they might have done something that they shouldn't have done. It was not even. It was not equal. And uh, so that gave me another perspective on the community. 
Um, Bill was implied by uh, was um, employed by Fight On to do literacy training. Fight On was an or was a factory that was built by the Fight Organization, um, and it was one of those things where they decided what we need to do in our own community is build a capacity for companies or you know that are going to make a profit, that are going to provide some employment, and perhaps be a conduit of employment from from where we are to the larger uh, factories. Um, the, the, the transportation to the larger factories never actually happened. Uh, and I, I think it then became Eltrex. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. but And I'm not sure if Eltrex is still alive. Uh, there are lots of things that happened in terms of practices of companies. For instance, one of the things, um, I, I don't know if it was Xerox or Kodak that supported um, Fight On originally. But Fight On, it was Xerox, okay. Fight On made boxes and containers for um, Xerox to ship their goods and services to other companies. And for a long time, that worked. And then in the nation, we went to a system of what's called on-time delivery, meaning that we don't take your inventory, we only take it as we need it. And you have to be able to deliver it on the dime whenever we call you and say we need a hundred of these. And we don't pay you till then either. So that kind of destroyed the economy of that kind of organization and so it, it failed. It however did spawn a lot of other um, African American companies. Uh, most of them consultants in various areas where they had expertise. And um, when I left city council and I left the bank, I became a consultant and did a lot of work in the various fields that I had been in, in education, in banking. Um, at one time, I was the only person <laughs> in the country that was identified by the trade magazines as providing consulting in community reinvestment. And I still think that was a good idea because community reinvestment is something every corporation should be doing. Every business in this community that gets its fire protection, its police protection, its road building, from a community ought to be giving something back to that community in some way and helping it deal with eco economic issues and the other issues that it faces. It, it's, um, it's an idea whose time had come, but unfortunately I think it's gone by the wayside in a lot of to today's banking situations. And one of the problems was, see, banks, if you wanted to merge, buy a new bank, offer a new service, and you apply to the federal um, regulating agencies to do this, if you had, were you discriminating, they could prove that you were discriminating by the loans you made, meaning that there would be large sections of the community where you didn't make any loans um, because you had decided and redlined those areas that you weren't, you know, it was too risky to make loans in those areas. Now, you might never have visited them, but you knew there were a lot of poor people in them, and you assumed, therefore, it meant that um, these, these uh, communities did not de to deserve to have loans and that they would hurt your business. And um, it was proven not to be true, necessarily. And so they were to do this, and I was the community reinvestment officer for Rochester Community Savings Bank at that time. And so when I got out of that, I decided to leave the bank, and that's another story you'll enjoy, uh, <laughs> my deciding. Um, I was, in some ways, I, I felt forced out, but it turned out to be good. And so that was, those were some things that happened. Um, and then when I got to city council, okay. when I got to city council, I found myself dealing with the same things. Housing, employment, police department, <laughs> criminal justice system. Um, and and um, I had all this background, you see, because of all these other things I had done. And as a debater, I, I did a lot of debating in high school, high school and college. I knew that you need to do research before you conclude what ought to happen. And it really, you know, can understand why it really troubles me that in a lot of cases when I hear people pronouncing certain conditions are okay uh, or certain people are not worthy, I have done a bit of research. It bothers me a lot. And not only that, I also find that there are a lot of people who are trying to rewrite history. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it is my understanding that the Texas legislature determined that any mention of slavery as a problem or a bad thing 
was to be removed from the textbooks. And you know where the textbooks for the whole country come from? Yeah, yeah, the Texas Depository. Good for you. You got the answer right. So that means that in the future we will not be teaching children the truth. That means we grow up on another whole group of people who are ignorant, and they feed fear, and they feed exclusivity. I guess, even though I've, I've given you all this bad news, <laughs> I think there are a lot of positive things going on. I, think, I see a lot of young people who just don't buy this stuff. Uh, they don't buy the prejudice, they don't buy the racial exclusion. They want to be one community, and they don't want to be bothered with all this baggage that we've carried from generation to generation in the community. Some of them are at a loss as to what they should do about it, but, but, but they really reject the whole thing. Now, I'm not sure they know enough about what has happened because I don't think we're teaching them and I don't think we're talking to them about some of the experiences and how we overcame them. So what I say to people when they say, well, what, what, what should we do? I say, well, each one of us has a responsibility. Look around you in the places where you are. Ask yourself if there are whole groups of people missing who ought not to be missing in the place where you work, in the place where you worship, in the place where you do business, in the places where you are um, spending your money. And then raise questions about that. I used to teach my students that the best thing you can do to help yourself learn and to change the paradigms that you want to change is to make sure you ask questions. I'm going to pause here and see if you... I, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.